Before Dark Souls saw the light of day, the Souls series had its starting point in a previous title, Demon Souls, a game that holds a lot of value to me as it was my introduction to a series I sunk hundreds if not thousands of hours into. Now with the release of Elden Ring, it amazes me how its director, Hidetaka Miyazaki, is able to produce hit after hit like nobody's business. But even with how great Elden Ring is, it still hasn't toppled Demon Souls as my favorite Souls title. Why is that? Well, partially it's nostalgia as no game since has kicked my ass so relentlessly which has stuck with me as a great experience. There is way, way more to it than that however, as the game is great even today. As Demon's Souls is a starting point for the Souls series, it had quite an interesting development cycle. At first it was meant to be a high fantasy role-playing game of some kind, but was later considered a failure within the company as the team lacked a coherent vision and ran into difficulties. Hearing about this, the series director Hidetaka Miyazaki succeeded in taking over the project as its director. He could take it in any direction he wanted, and if it didn't work out, big deal! The game was already considered a failure. He couldn't do worse than it already was. That said, it was far from smooth sailing. He had to keep the details about the game hidden, such as the potential of losing currency upon death and the game's overall difficulty. The game was however never meant to be difficult for the sole reason of being hard. Miyazaki wanted the game to feel rewarding for the player by their own accomplishments. When King Alan of Boletaria sought greater power, he released a being known as the Old One into the world, and with it a colorless demon fog swept across the land, turning people into soul-devouring demons. That's where you come in! The Demon Slayer! Wait a minute. Oh, my bad. I meant the Slayer of Demons. A simple mistake to make. Your job as the Slayer of Demons is to collect all of the Archdemon souls to put the Old One back to its slumber to prevent their world from being destroyed by the fog. Before you can start the game you have to create a character. Pretty standard stuff for an RPG. You can however tell that the developers have never done a character creator before as it's nearly impossible to make a decent looking character with how every slider affects another one somewhere. You also can't view what your stats do before entering the game for whatever reason. It's not a major flaw as you can check what they do after you enter the game, but still, from the name alone some of these seem identical so you have no idea which one to focus on and others straight up might not function as you expect them to. The game's manual covers this, but who used those back in 2010? For your first character, you're forced to go through the tutorial where it teaches you the basics of the game through messages. Interestingly enough, you can't die until you reach the boss. Either they wanted you to be able to read all of the messages and get some practice with the controls, or they didn't know how to change the respawn point before entering the fog gate at the end. It's just a weird aspect of the game that never appears in the series again. I'm leaning towards the latter as the whole point is to get your ass kicked by the boss. If you do manage to beat them however, you get some powerful early game items and a one-way trip to Knockoutsville. So that's cool. If you're a serious veteran, you might find it weird that I said you get power for healing items, and that's because this game doesn't use esters or ashen esters, but instead it has grass and spices. Grass comes in various grades that gradually goes from healing a small amount of HP to a full heal that removes any ailments. The healing items drop like candy though, so it's highly unlikely that you'll ever run out, but it can be a bit annoying to shuffle through healing items mid-fight or farm them if you do manage to run out of them. As for spices, there are only two of them, a 50 mana and a 100 mana restoration respectively. Only a single type of enemy in the game drops these, so if you're a mage, expect to farm these enemies a lot or farm souls to buy more. A vendor in the main hub sells the 50 mana version. Speaking of main hubs, welcome to the Nexus, a fantastic looking place with everything you could need a small distance away from one another. As this game has a limit on how much you can carry in your inventory, Thomas here will help you lighten that load and it's the kindest NPC in the game. You have a heart of gold. Don't let them take it from you. Next to Thomas is the blacksmith Ed, who unlike Thomas comes off as a real asshole. No interest, eh? I can tell you're not gonna last long here. What's the hurry? Where you off to? Have you any manners? He can upgrade your weapons and repair your stuff. Thankfully, any upgrade materials you need can be used while stored in Thomas, so you don't need to micromanage the upgrade process. All of the faith vendors are in the same corner of the Nexus. Umbasa. 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 
On the opposite side are all of the sorcery vendors neatly packed together. Down the ominous black gate are lots of developer tips about how the game works. Lastly, for NPCs, we have the Maiden in Black who levels you up in exchange for souls. While she appears at random locations around the Nexus, it's always around the center, so it's easy to find. Finally, the most important part of the hub area are these, the Archstones. Interacting with them will teleport you to the different worlds that the game has to offer, but at the start only Bulletaria is opened. And for good reason, as its first section is the real tutorial level of the game. The initial tutorial I talked about earlier serves to teach you the controls. This one will ease you into the mindset developers want you to have while exploring the rest of the game. At the start of this section of the game called Boletarian Palace, it can potentially reward the player right off the bat if they decide to explore the area behind the Archstone. Late Moongrass is a strong healing item for this part of the game as it heals a fixed 400 HP and encourages players to finally to keep thinking outside the box in their exploration. Even if a player doesn't think of this, the level has similar rewards scattered about. The level will test you fighting weaker enemies in groups, weaker enemies with range support, slightly stronger enemies in groups, teach you to pay attention to your surroundings, once with this firebomb throwing asshole and this bigger asshole that shoves a boulder down onto you, and as a final challenge you get to go one on one with a blue eyed knight. This knight is by far the strongest normal enemy you've faced thus far. Before going further I want to mention that some areas look badly designed as the servers are no longer available through normal means. This red eyed knight that will completely demolish a new player, and this pit are good examples. There's no indication that this pit will kill you, it looks pretty enticing to walk down off with the animation they gave it, but it's a normal death pit. They're trying to trick you. But at the same time, it's so people can use the two passive online features of the game. Bloodstains and messages. There will be plenty of bloodstains that show people who fell down and died, and at least a handful of messages telling you to be careful. The same would be this case for the red-eyed knight I mentioned earlier. This is also the case for a few other things in the level, such as the boulders that are blocked by planks and the dragon that sweep the bridge. Bloodstains and messages will give you plenty of hints on what to do or to expect, but now when those features are gone, dying to any of them might feel cheap. Getting back on track, the level continues to reward exploring, giving you the cling ring that reduces the game's brutal 50% max HP loss on death to 75% at the cost of a ring slot. A shortcut back out, a merchant. Good day to you, care to look over my wares? Mostly stolen, but who's telling you? and the option to rescue an NPC that will give you an item. Please, help me. I am trapped, surrounded by dreglings. My thanks for your brave rescue. I am Ostrava of Boletaria. Accept this as a token of my gratitude. He later shows up in the Nexus. Eventually you make your way through the level and open the gate to the boss. Even here the game is trying to hint towards its weakness by giving you plenty of fire bombs and some turpentine that enchants your weapon with fire for a short time. The boss, Phalanx, is pretty simple as he has a blob of enemies that the player has seen before and that's fine as they know how to deal with them. It's also forgiving that the way back in case you die is a straight line from the archstone and this is why the starter Boletaria is such a good introduction. It eases you into the combat by getting progressively more difficult, rewards you plenty for exploring, like giving you items or encountering NPCs, and shows you the value of reading the messages or checking bloodstains when you're certain of something. Or at least when they were still available. After killing Phalanx, the game completely opens up. Now you can enter any archstone and tackle the game any way you want. This gives you plenty of leeway if you're stuck in a specific world. You can try another one and come back later when you're a higher level and have new gear. 
Aldo and odd design choices that you're meant to tackle every world one step at a time. Looking at the souls you get from all of the bosses, it's clear that the developers want you to kill the first boss in every world and then go on to kill the second boss in every world, then the third and finally the last boss in Boletaria. Of course, you're not locked into this route, but I thought it was interesting to mention regardless. With that said, the open-ended routing is excellent for replayability, as you can get any sort of build you want relatively quickly. Let's say I've played the game a few times and I want to get a busted mage build going. For this, I need the Magic Sharpness Ring, Crisp Blade, Insanity Catalyst, and the spells Firestorm and Ignite. For this, I have to clear all of Stonefang Tunnel for the Crisp Blade, unlock the ability to create boss weapons, more on that later, and the soul of the world's final boss to get Firestorm. In the Tower of Latria, I need to get the Ring and Boss Soul for the Catalyst. Lastly, I need to go to Balataria and kill Tower Knight to gain access to the second to last area and do a quest to rescue the sorcery teacher so I can learn Ignite and Firestorm. You go on ahead. I do not wish to be a dead weight. With all that said and done, I need to clear 8 out of the 16 of the game's bosses. It's half the game, but getting everything for this mage build is probably the longest required setup for any build, at least from what I can think of. Normally, if you want to get a boss weapon, you can get it after a minimum of 3 bosses and a maximum of 6. All things considered, there does exist a lot of replay value. One thing to mention with this build is the use of the Insanity Catalyst, which is something that's difficult to find as it's a boss weapon. You see, to create a boss weapon in this game, you first need to kill the second boss in Stonefang Tunnel, Flame Lurker, and bring his soul back to Blacksmith End at the start of the world. However, to actually craft a boss weapon, you need another weapon of a certain type and with a specific rank. In the case of the Insanity Catalyst, you only need a Catalyst and you're done. But for something like the Large Sword of Searching, the boss weapon from the second boss in Shrine of Storms, you first need any of the following weapons at plus 8, and there's just no way to know this. If you don't look anything up, you can only find these weapons by chance, and you need to be upgrading it Ed to even see them when they're available. Let's face it. Most people aren't going to be upgrading at the start of Stormfang Tunnel very often. Upgrading weapons also requires tons of materials, but you can farm these in certain parts of the game. A bit tedious, but nothing too major. Luckily, there's an easy duplication glitch that only requires a single item for it to work. Some will think that using this glitch goes against the spirit of the game, but after your 50th playthrough it only saves time. I do not, however, recommend using this glitch if you never played the game before, as it will ruin your experience as a first-timer. Something I'm not a big fan of is how quests are handled. Aside from Ostrava, the guy you can rescue at the start of Boletaria, a new player will either miss quests entirely or only find one part of them. After beating Phalanx, most players will continue to try and finish Boletaria. At the end of the second section, right before the boss, there's a locked door that the player will most likely forget about. To unlock it, you have to beat Tower Knight, the second boss of the world, but you can't progress afterwards. To get through the fog gate at the back of its boss arena, you have to get an Archdemon Soul, which is any boss at the end of a world. So this means that you're tasked with finding the locked door and somehow remember it after clearing an entire world, and who knows how long that take? You might kill a boss in the Tower of Latria, and then two bosses in the Valley of Defilement, and they clear all of Shrine of Storms. We're talking hours upon hours before you might come back and then start clearing the third section of Boletaria. Not only that, but you need to find the key to the door in the third section of the world, and then figure out to try and open the door again before the Tower Knight boss. At the very least, this quest is somewhat reasonable to figure out, even though it is quite silly. The quest in many of the other worlds a new player must just get lucky to stumble across, as for example, Selene and Satsuki only appear if the world tendency is pure white. Hang on, I can hear you say. What the hell is world tendency? And I'm glad you asked. For starters, these things on the UI aren't just for show. They give you a rough idea of where your world and character tendency is located from pure white to grey and finally pure black. There are a few intermediate steps between each color, but for the sake of simplicity we'll be looking at these three. World tendencies share a common ground in that they change the stats of enemies with pure white decreasing their HP, attack and defense while pure black increases them. After that their effects are widely different. 
Pure White World Tendency decreases the amount of upgrade materials to drop, increases the drop rate of healing items, and increases attack power by 20% if you're in soul form. The state that gives you less health and makes you look like a phantom. Pure Black World Tendency increases the amount of souls you get from killing enemies and the drop rate of rare items. It also causes Black Phantom versions of enemies and NPCs that are far stronger than the normal counterparts to spawn. A thing to note here is that Black Phantom versions of regular enemies spawn before you even reach Pure Black, so the sudden change in difficulty can happen quite suddenly. Rare Chunk is called Primeval Demons will spawn around Pure Black and it's one of the only ways to get souls that can upgrade special weapons that you find in worlds such as the Adjudicator Shield. The icing on top of this devilish cake is that your max HP gets reduced in soul form. So instead of running around with 50% HP without the Kling Ring, you only have somewhere around 45% to beat a harder version of the world with. Character tendency is more straightforward. At pure white you get 20% increase attack power in soul form and in pure black your max HP is reduced in soul form to 45%. All the other bonuses are multiplayer related and thus inaccessible by normal means. I'm not going into detail about how to change world or character tendencies towards a specific color and there's a crap ton of potential ways to do it, but the most important ones to know is that killing a boss shifts the world towards white and dying in body form, the only way to get all of your health back, shifts the world tendency towards black. That's right, wanting max health and dying punishes you. God, I love this game! I have mixed feelings on this system. I like the concept that your character's actions are literally changing the state of the world you're in and in turn you get unique quests and weapons out of it, but the execution feels sloppy. Nothing in the game tells you how this works, not even the manual says anything specific about it. In fact, it says exactly this. <clears throat> the soul tendency of each area and the player can be seen here. Actions like dying and defeating certain enemies causes the world tendency to shift between white, grey and black affecting enemy strength and a player's stats in soul form. New enemies and passages may also appear at certain tendencies. So you get a brief overview, but only that. You still have to on your own to figure out what changes it. Then there's the issue that the game actively punishes you for going around the body form, which is the only way to get max health or to summon other players to help you out. And if you die, the world you're struggling with becomes harder. Meanwhile, if you're doing well and get closer to pure white world tendency, the game gets easier as no black phantoms will spawn, enemies will have reduced stats and you get more healing items. It's weird from a game design perspective that the struggling player will have an even tougher time on the part they're stuck on while the more skilled player will have an easier time getting through the game. In a way, it almost feels like some aspects of world tendency should be swapped around. Black phantoms should spawn in the game at pure white world tendency to give the player more of a challenge. On the other side of the spectrum, a struggling player at pure black maybe shouldn't get weaker enemies, but I think it's fair to increase the drop rate of healing items for them. This way, both players will get a decent challenge for their skill level. As the system is implemented right now, I've seen plenty of times where players commit suicide in the Nexus when they get body form from killing a boss to keep their world tendency in a world at white. What world tendency the Nexus has doesn't matter as there's no tendency related events for it. The combat in Demon's Souls will look familiar to any Souls veteran. You have your light attack, heavy attack, push, also known as kick, parry, backstab and so on. The major difference in this game is that you don't have any plunge attacks and, while not being part of combat, you have no way to jump. You can climb ledges though, so I guess that's pretty cool. Sadly, Demon's Souls suffered the same fate as Dark Souls 1, where you have 4 directional rolling while locked on. For that reason alone, lock on in this game is virtually useless. It's hard enough to dodge certain attacks as is, and being limited to only rolling four directions doesn't help. There's no reason to lock onto an enemy except for specific circumstances like enemies that are easier to fight with a shield than trying to roll through their attacks. That brings me straight into the game's bosses. They range from being pushovers to incredibly difficult. At the time of release, now all bosses by King Island are easy. In the case of the man eaters, their AI can behave quite interestingly at times. Funny thing about this boss and its AI, one time I had one of them fall off the bridge and never showed up again. I have no idea what caused that to happen, I've only ever seen it once. The AI for King Allen's dash attack also acts funny at times. The hitboxes for boss attacks are fine, but the windup is unreasonably fast for some of them.
However, the more I thought about those specific attacks and other aspects of the game, that might be the point. You see, I firmly believe that the game wasn't designed to be fully dodgeable, unlike many other Souls games, a shield can be your best friend for a load of bosses and enemies. Considering that one boss is literally called the Penetrator, and the Moonlight Greatsword of this game is unblockable, and a boss uses blocking as a tactic against you, I get the feeling that the game was primarily designed with a shield in mind. At the very least, they thought shields were strong enough to add a boss against shield users, a sword for players to use against shields, and one boss that uses turtling as their main tactic against you. One big plus I will give to Demon Souls is that all of the bosses look unique and are memorable in their own right, and even with that widely changing difficulty curve for the game's bosses, that's all I could ask for in the Souls series starting point. Now that I've mentioned lots of things, such as routing, tendencies and the general aspect of controlling a character, how is this put into practice for a new player? I'm glad to say that I have the best example one could ask for, my very first own character! I never managed to beat the game as him, so he's the perfect example to try and see what a brand new player might find and do. I think that I've looked some things up, but we'll get to that. So for this character I was going with the regular mindset I have for many RPGs where I try to build as tanky as possible the first time around because I don't really know what I'd be able to face. By the indication of this set, the Brushwood Armor. It's the heaviest armor in the game and gives you the most amount of defense points, although it's not that efficient, but we'll get to that in a second. For my stats, it's pretty standard stuff. For a tanky character I have Endurance, I have HP and I have Strength. I put some stats into Intelligence and Magic, because at some point I found a light magic weapon that enhances your weapon with magic. I didn't seem to find many good weapons in the game, as I still have the longsword at plus 5. So while I did upgrade it, again, I didn't find any sort of boss weapon or any sort of magic weapon because of the soul tendency system. I do however have the magic sword Makoto with katana, which is a world tendency event weapon. And that's what I meant with I assume I've looked something up because I have no idea how I'm supposed to find this weapon on my own. As for the different worlds, I did manage to beat most of the games. I had the last section in Boletaria left, I have finished all of Stonefang Tunnel, I finished all of Tower Latria, all of Shrine of Storms, and I haven't even set foot in the Valley of Defilement. Probably for the best, because I might have just rage quit, knowing how I was at the time. I did mention earlier that you're very unlikely to run out of healing items, but uh, somehow I did manage to do that here. And this is potentially how a character could have looked like if it's your first ever Souls game. While there's a good general idea of what I've been doing here, like going tanky and just trying to, well, brute force my way through everything, I did almost beat the game. Sure, I have run out of healing items, so I will need to farm them, and I will need lots and lots of attempts on the remaining areas and bosses to actually beat the game. But it's fully beatable even if you haven't played them before, as shown by this character. One last thing about anything gameplay related. Armor. It makes no sense. Do yourself a favor and get the Black Ledger set. It was practically nothing used to the most defense for every point of weight with a question. It's absolutely ridiculous. What were you thinking? In the depths of the Valley of the Firemen, you can fight the Large Sword of Moonlight, or as it's more commonly known as in the community, the Moonlight Greatsword. A weapon of heavy importance in the world and story of Kingsfield, an earlier series made by From Software and that makes many appearances in the Soul series. Demon Souls is also the origin point of the Storm Ruler, Educator Shield, Sparkly the Crow. You scary give Sparkly me. Give Twinkly me me. You trade trade give me Sparkly Twinkly and everyone's favorite NPC, Patches. Oh, hello again. Hey, don't turn a cold shoulder. I didn't mean to do you wrong. Really? Come on now. We've got better things to fret about. That pit there is filled with treasure. But, uh, I can't get to it myself. Go on, have a look. It's more riches than I've ever dreamed of. What's keeping you? Have a look at that treasure down in the pit. Then we'll work out a way to fish it out.
Don't hold it against me, eh? Take your time, starving to death. Then I'll sell every last trinket off your corpse. <laughs> He's been in pretty much every Souls game afterwards, excluding Dark Souls 2 and Sekiro. If you uh, want to come to Sekiro as a Souls game, I don't know. The atmosphere in Demon Souls is still strong to this day. Starting in Boletaria, it's important to note that most people have fled the area due to the fog that turns people into demons that have crept over the land. In fact, this is a recent event as can be seen by the fresh food left on the tables at the start of the world and it caused havoc that left corpses and dead animals scattered everywhere. The area feels sorta of empty when walking through it which is perfect given the circumstances but other than that nothing really stands out like the other levels do and that's fine as it accomplishes its goal. In Stonefang Tunnel you're greeted with a stunning sunset that sets the area apart by giving it a completely new color palette. If you only played the remake, do not be fooled, this is not a desert area. The castle you see off in the distance might be the Boletarian Palace and even if it isn't, there are clearly a forest surrounding it. If anything, it's located in a mountainous region of the world. The remake butchers the art direction of the original, but that's a topic for another time. Stonefang Tunnel is completely different from Boletaria, even on the inside with lots of mining equipment, fortress, lava, and as you go deeper into the mines you meet all sorts of creatures like fire geckos, the armored spider, lava spitting worms, and bear bugs that look like they're made of partially molten rock. It really does feel like you're treading ever deeper underground with the weird creatures that you encounter. Tower of Latria changes the color palette again to an eerie green to both represent the twisted place you're in and that it's nighttime. Tower of Latria is split into two sections. The first is a massive prison that's masterfully executed. When walking around you'll hear prisoners making agonizing sounds and an NPC screaming for help. Please help me. All the while the prisoners wardens are roaming the area that you can clearly see from a distance as their ominous lanterns illuminate the halls. Not only that, but you can immediately tell something's wrong with this place as the prisoners left hanging in their cells with multiple different torture devices spread across its multiple floors. The second part of the Tower of Latria builds upon this idea and throws Lovecraft into the mix. These gargoyles all drop souls of soldiers suggesting that they've been twisted into their current form. There's also like these centipede monsters that are constructed by fusing several people together. And this giant clump of flesh is probably their nest as they crawl out of it once you cause it to crash into the ground. The nest is also alive as you can hear a heartbeat when you're standing close to it. Shrine of Storms immediately gives you the sense that you're in a land far, far away by surrounding you with a vast ocean that reaches as far as the eye can see. The occult nature of this place is made evident early on as these silver skeletons animate and are being powered by what appears to be a soul or spirit possessing them. This is also the only area in the game with illusionary walls. As you delve deeper into the world, more spirits appear that are summoned by these reaper looking guys. The boss is built upon this with the Adjudicator being a creature of legend as seen in the description of the shield depicting him and the second boss being a shamanistic looking warrior of legend. The Valley of Defilement all the way through shoves the atmosphere down your throat. Everything looks filthy and disease ridden. The buildings are worn down or just makeshift built. The sound of its resonance are that of agonized individuals. This only gets worse the further in you go. You have giant ticks that poison you on getting hit, rats that will give you the plague, a giant leech monster that sends its swarm onto you and reduces the effectiveness of your healing items, a massive poison swamp consumed by darkness, a small town of these disease-ridden individuals, an animated nest of flesh-eating black flies, and finally at the core of it all, a plague-ridden swamp full of aborted babies and people worshipping a maiden that absorbed an archdemon soul to try and help them. Everything in this world is filled with disease, despair and tragedy. While Valley of Defilement is a nightmare to go through the first time, the atmosphere leaves me stunned looking back on it. One thing to note about the last section of the Valley of Defilement is that the storyline of Maiden Australia, the maiden who absorbed an archdemon soul to help others, is there to invoke doubt in your mind. Clearly not all archdemons are monsters. In this case it's a human being who only did it to help others. 
Maybe what you're doing is wrong in the grand scheme of things, but you can't return the old one to its slumber without killing her. In fact, if you kill her lover who's guarding her, she doesn't even fight back but commits suicide in front of you. You... you killed him, didn't you? Very well. I can no longer resist you. Do as you like. Take your precious demon soul. This is sorta of the same concept as when you get to Gwyn in Dark Souls 1. You expect to hear this epic boss theme as you're finally going face to face with the Lord of Fire himself, but instead you're greeted with a somber piano playing throughout the entire fight, clearly telling you that there's something deeper, something tragic that's occurred behind the scenes. A strain invokes a similar feeling partially through the music but also the dialogue. In a way it's a prototype Gwyn. Leave us, slayer of demons. This is a sanctuary for the lost and the wretched. There is nothing here for you to pillage or plunder. Please, leave quietly. You will not turn back, will you? I shall let no harm come to dearest destroyer. May you rot in the deepest depths of this swamp. The music is much like Dark Souls. It's mostly the bosses that get the treatment of having music to enhance the experience of fighting them, but most tracks are nowhere near as EPIC as the other games. I'd argue it's intentional to reflect the dying state of the world. It's sorta of like if you took an orchestra and then 80% of the fled. You'll still get a soundtrack out of it, but it would be less epic in scale and slower pace to make up for the lack of people. But that's just what happened with the fog rolled into Boletaria. Most people fled, leading it weaker and more sparse than ever before. They still manage to do epic tracks as that's what the intro goes for. It tries to prepare you for the harsh journey that's ahead. The track's pretty fast paced for Demon's Soul standards. After creating a character, you're greeted with a slower song to ease you into the atmosphere. And after being a phalanx to unlock the rest of the art stone, the game goes all in in the slower, somber tone. Of course, that's not to say all songs follow this pattern, but most do to some extent. You have some energetic ones like Tower Knight. <laughs> An armor spider. But it makes sense, for Tower Knights are slowly infiltrating the capital city and the kingdom's forces are trying to stop you from reaching the throne room with all their might. Meanwhile, the armor spider is just that, a spider. The song is its animalistic energy on full display with a dash of eeriness to it. It shoots fireballs at you and breathes fire for crying out loud. Other tracks are more tense rather than epic such as Flame Lurker.
I love the atmosphere the song gives off. It's foreboding and tells you that this guy's trouble. A song doesn't need to be grandiose to work as a boss theme. In this case, just making you feel tense works wonders. When fighting Leechmonger, the song tries to invoke a sense of horror as you're finding an abomination of sentient leeches. On the other hand, the next boss, Dirty Colossus, is a swarm of black flies trying to control their entire hive. They're slow and clumsy as a result, much like the song. I can go on and on about the soundtrack, but my point is that its lack of energy in places is a strength rather than a weakness. With that said, I want to end this section by mentioning two more things. The game's intro song and the theme for King Allen share the same opening. I adore this easy to miss connection between the two. King Allen is the person who released the fog, and thus the state of the world, and by proxy the entire game, would have never come to be without him. It's absolutely brilliant. Finally, the Nexus serves as your safe place and that's reflected in the abundance of silence in its starting theme. It's sort of like the musicians can take their time to play and don't have to worry about things. After killing three archdemons, the theme changes, and while it does contain silence like the original song, it has less of it and is more urgent in tone to reflect that you're closer and closer to reaching the old one. All in all, the music is unique compared to the series as a whole and evokes a myriad of different feelings that the other games have a hard time replicating. Yes, there are great tracks in the other games that manage to link itself with the characters such as Ludwig's theme from Bloodborne or Gwyn's theme in Dark Souls 1 that I mentioned earlier, but most of them are just epic pieces for the sake of intensifying the fight. I'm not saying that Demon's Souls has my favorite soundtrack, but I do find it to be the most memorable out of the bunch. Now that we've gone into the end of what I wanted to say, what do I think about the game? While there are some negatives surrounding it, they're primarily aimed towards new players. Once you've beaten the game a few times, the world tendency is fun to play around with instead of being cryptic and punishing. That testing new builds is super easy to do with how open ended the routing is gives the game an edge over the rest of the series. Although it may not be a difficult game by today's standards, the atmosphere, music and replayability will always have me coming back every now and then for more. With that said, I can't deny that there is a degree of nostalgia added into the mix as the game is objectively clunky in some aspect of its control and I can see why that puts some people off from finishing it. However, if you're a fan of the Soul series, I would highly recommend giving the original Demon's Souls a try at some point to experience its origins. 
It might not be your favorite game, but it's undoubtedly an important part of Souls history where you can find the first draft of a lot of ideas that made it into the first Dark Souls. Demon Souls would leave an impression on you one way or another. Finally, in the video I made passing mentions of how the online specific mechanics of the game can be accessed through, quote, normal means. There does exist a private server that's fully functional with bloodstains, messages and summons. If you're interested in giving the game a try and don't mind some minor tweaking to get the full intended experience with online play enabled, I leave a link to the game's discord which has a guide on how to access the game server in the private server channel in the video description. My name's Alexander and thanks for watching all the way through. Leave a like and subscribe if you want to hear my opinions on other games. See you next time.